Thank you all for coming to this final event in the summer film series, and thank you to our online viewers as well. Um, this is our conclusive event in the summer film series. We're ending with a lecture. Um, and we have here today film scholar Terry Ginsberg, who will share her work on Palestine solidarity filmmaking. Terry Ginsberg is assistant professor of film at the American University in Cairo. She received her doctorate in cinema studies from New York University and has taught film, media, literary, and cultural studies at Rutgers University, NYU, Dartmouth College, Ithaca College, SUNY Purchase, and the City University of New York. Her areas of scholarly expertise include Palestinian Israeli cinema, German cinema, Holocaust film, critical theory, gender and sexuality studies, and theories of academic pedagogy and institutions. Her book-length publications include a multi-authored, co-edited encyclopedia entitled Historical Dictionary of Middle Eastern Cinema, a monograph entitled Holocaust Film, The Political Aesthetics of Ideology, and two co-edited collections titled Perspectives on German Cinema and a Companion to German Cinema. Um, I'm going to skip through her lengthy biography, but you can read about it more uh, from our website. Um, her talk today will focus predominantly on the 1974 documentary titled To Live in Freedom, directed by Simon Luvish, and featuring Palestinian writer and intellectual Fauzi al -Asmar. In so doing, she will examine the relationship between Zionism, European colonialism, class stratification, and racism in Palestine-Israel, and will suggest the historical ties between the establishment of the film studies discipline in the 1960s and the U.S. government interference in the sociocultural sphere. So thank you, and uh, let's welcome our speaker. Thank you very much, Samira. Thanks to the uh, Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center for having me, and thank you all uh, for coming today. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me fine? Good. Solidarity films that deal explicitly with the struggle in Palestine, Israel, present by their very nature a cultural and discursive absence. Even when produced in countries nominally allied with Palestinians, such films not only are relatively rare, but are subject to tremendous controversy, if not outright suppression. In recent years, the proliferation of publicly accessible Palestinian-Israeli struggle documentaries in the midst of an ever more influential boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS movement, has prompted a vicious cultural reaction from the Zionist camp that has entailed the explicit and unabashed violation of labor and speech rights, especially across North American campuses and the intellectual public sphere. In my talk today, I shall supply some background to this widespread suppression of anti-Zionist and pro-Palestinian speech it is, as it has been conditioned within the field of cinema studies, my field. And I shall in turn discuss a quite radical Palestinian Palestine solidarity film from the early 1970s entitled To Live in Freedom that to my mind offers precisely the kind of analysis of the struggle which Zionists today wish to silence at all costs and which for that reason at least is eminently necessary to our understanding of how the current Zionist onslaught might be countered and ultimately defeated. The scholarly field of cinema studies has played a significant role in conditioning and main maintaining the academic suppression of anti-Zionist and pro-Palestinian speech, whereupon scholarship on Palestinian and Palestine solidarity documentaries has been minimal. The history of the emergence of cinema studies is a key factor in this phenomenon. That history is traceable to the peculiar interest pro promoted by the U.S. government during the 1940s and 50s to modern art and especially abstract expressionism. It is by now relatively well known that the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, spearheaded a massive operation to advance its struggle against communism and in relation for the imperial hegemony of U.S. capital by waging what Francis Stoner Saunders has called a cultural cold war. Top on the en enemies list were, not surprisingly, Soviet and leftist art movements and practices that challenged and critiqued the ideology of capitalism and post-World War II U.S. triumphalism. 
Initially, the list had included an avant-garde artistic trend in painting that later would be dubbed abstract expressionism by those who would eventually mainstream it. Characterized by an apparently anarchistic formalism that drawing loosely from French surrealism, eschewed content in favor of attention to manifest structures against which its makers wished initially to stage a materialist critique of American industrialism. Abstract expressionism was at first rejected by the CIA as the product of presumed communist elements in the US modern art scene. Once it became clear, however, that the nascent movement's growing international cachet, itself supported during the 1940s by the US State Department and Office of War Information, could serve the US national interest by helping advance internationally the idea that America was not as devoid of serious culture as Euro European aficionados assumed, the CIA, with the help of Congress, began conspiring to co-opt the movement. This strategy was viewed as particularly important in the context of the Marshall Plan, which at the cultural level was working to captivate the European psyche and by extension economy through saturation of, US, uh, of, of European markets with Hollywood films, American music, and dance, etc. Insofar as those particular cultural occasions were primarily circulated and received as low-brow art forms, however, the doyens of European high art could still claim superiority to American creative efforts on the basis of which it could justify organized and concerted resistance to them. Hence, predating the general strategy of contemporary Israeli Hasbara by more than half a century, the CIA reevaluated its position vis-a-vis -vis abstract expressionism and decided that its ostensible lack of content was the perfect foil to European and Soviet modernism. Soon, paintings by artists such as Jackson Pollock, Robert Motherwell, which had as early as 1941 and at the suggestion of the State Department, received financial support from the Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA, in New York City through those works purchase and exhibition with great aplomb, were being exhibited in an increasing number of international art shows, which publicized them under the rubric of the New York School as examples of American cultural sophistication, indeed as allegories, aesthetically speaking, of US techno-cultural development and the ideology of laissez-faire. During much of the 1950s, this co-optation of abstract expressionism by MoMA and the cultural elites and CIA front foundation supporting it was loudly criticized and lampooned, not least by avant-garde poets, novelists, and filmmakers, many of whose works drew from traditions similar to those which had, uh, had uh, influenced abstract expressionism and which positioned them as well into the canon of modernism. By the 1960s, those marginal critical voices were themselves subjected to co-optation as the ac academic study of film, hinging initially upon the celebration of the cinematic avant-garde, reaching as far back as the 1920s and coming to center on the revered figure of director Maya Deren, took hold at major universities for prime example, my alma mater, NYU. The idea here was to establish a scholarly field that would, echoing MoMA before it, elevate a mass ornament, in this case one produced by Hollywood, to the status of high art, partly in an effort to reinvigorate through re-legitimation the post-studio film industry after its enforced breakup during the 1950s, partly in a related effort to place U.S. cinematic product back into profitable competition with the burgeoning European auteur cinemas and partly as a ruse to reinforce the same Cold War rhetoric that had been advanced through the promotion of a co-opted abstract expressionism. Cinema, after all, is a decidedly modern art, one far more technologically sophisticated than painting or poetry for that matter, and is by its mass reproducibility and structure as an ideological apparatus far more effective as a vehicle of propaganda and mass interpolation. I should note here that a paper presented at the ninth annual Human Sciences Conference at George Washington University in 2003 suggested that the establishment of cinema studies as an academic field was generated by some of the same covert forces responsible for the co-optation of abstract expressionism. 
indeed evident within U.S. film studies, which apropos of the post-war period was more heavily staked in reinforcing Cold War ideology and the imperialism it rationalized than its British and French counterparts, was an abiding McCarthyism, camouflaged in a disingenuous articulation of new left positions for which self-declared Marxist scholarship was inevitably guilty by association with Stalinism. Complementing this flawed and confused position, which is not significantly diminished, in fact, it has strengthened until very recently vis-a-vis -vis the Arab uprisings and the subsequent op Occupy movement, was a profoundly Eurocentric understanding of film aesthetics for which cinematic representation must be considered always inadequate, always inadequate to its object, whether actual, as in the case of documentary, or imaginary, as in the case of narrative fiction. The cinematic real, that is, was viewed finally along phenomenological lines, which means that it was viewed as inaccessibly other because perceived as excessive to our capacity to comprehend and understand it, and thus, in a sense, as unspeakable. Cinema, in other words, was recognized reflexively as a sublime occasioning, constituted by what it, as an industrial aesthetic apparatus, was thought only able to display in absentia, what it apparently must manage and contain through mystification and obfuscation, lest it reproduce in its spectator an impulse latent to the capitalist system, conditioning the very emergence and enabling the very development of cinema to rehearse and regenerate the presumed necessary instability and violence attributed falsely to the unconscious core of cinematic projection. The contrary attempt to reveal and display the affective excess of cinematic projection what philosopher Slava Zizek has in another context called the sublime object of ideology was considered an obscenity. In the predominantly Eurocentric field of film studies, the ultimate paradigm of such obscenity, theorized in its worst case as an aesthetic potentiation of fascism, was and is the Holocaust. The industrialized mass murder of millions of mostly European and West Asian people by Western and Central European governments and forces during World War II within veritable factories of death. Important, crucial for our conversation today is the fact that the rendering obscene of a Holocaust moving image culture and its serious analysis within the field of cinema studies, including its publishing venues and its curricular and written canon via this highly Eurocentric philosophical framework has produced a convenient and deliberate marginalization, indeed a near complete absenting of serious discourse and analysis of what Norman Finkelstein, discussing the Holocaust, refers to as the abuse, quote unquote, the abuse of anti-Semitism that has served to justify the establishment of the Jewish exclusivist state of Israel and with it the expansion of Zionism throughout uh, the Palestinian region and beyond. By turn, the field has paid hardly a word to Palestinian and Palestine solidarity cinema and to critiques of Zionism and U.S. foreign policy where those matters are concerned. By extension, during the 1980s, when cinema studies experienced its greatest institutional expansion, attention promoted within new left academic circles grew exponentially to the cinemas of Latin America uh, and West Africa, to progressive third world documentaries and to third world representational theory, while focus on cinema of and about the Arab world was kept and remains at a comparative minimum across the political cultural spectrum, most troublingly on the left. At conferences like the Society for Cinema and Media Studies and in many scholarly publication venues, you may now hear or read papers on Indian cinema, Iranian cinema, Singapore cinema, Turkish cinema, and the Eastern European cinemas of the former Soviet bloc. But again, comparatively speaking, barely a word is uttered on Arab cinema, not least the cinema of Palestine. This is all because at the theoretical register, to take seriously the matter of cinematic obscenity, exemplarized by the field's love-hate relationship with the Holocaust, would mean having to confront the phenomenological ruse, 
to name the sublime obscenity of cinematic projection and its industrial technological means and their study for what they were and are. One, the dissimulation of the surplus value, the profit motive, which stands as the real content of representational excess, the very content deemed absent from abstract expressionism. And two, the dissimulation of one of the most powerful fronts of US-led capitalist imperialism, the is Israeli state, whose Zionist underpinnings continue at once to serve the racist colonization of Palestine by so-called Jewish nationalists and to offer a means, profoundly misguided and ineffectual, by which the US and its largely North American and European allies may attempt to secure much prized, increasingly scarce resources produced in the region, which have become foundational to propping up the value of the US dollar and in turn to controlling and containing the labor that would potentially revolutionize these profoundly inequitable and destructive conditions. These are very real issues which cinema study simply does not, will not discuss. This is all to say that the largely phenomenological understanding of film aesthetics pervasive within US film studies that was initially promoted ideologically by and through the scholarly co-optation of the cinematic avant-garde has facilitated the positioning of Zionism and the Palestinian struggle against it and the precarious positioning of the Arab world generally um, in relation to that struggle as a structured absence within academic film circles. The elephant in the room, whose discovery and sustained analysis and critique would effectively incriminate the field for its neo-McCarthyist complicity in the ongoing ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people and all of the ramifications thereof, including the long-standing turmoil, violence, chaos, and neo-colonial maldevelopment throughout the region. Even now, the Society for Cinema and Media Studies, the premier academic society organization for this field, um, for that, that organization's formal alliance with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which recent scholarship has confirmed is long compliant with official and covert US exceptionalism, bellicosity, anti-leftism, and the surveillance agencies, te technologies, and culture facilitating them, continues this agenda at the pan-institutional level. Documentary films about the struggle in Palestine-Israel are in this context recognizable as barometers of a heightened cultural Cold War. Most recent works in this area set their critical horizons, however, at the doorstep of Zionism, choosing to expose the latest Israeli atrocities and or acts of Palestinian resistance while refraining from entering that more contentious space where the deeper currents of the struggle may be found. My discussion of To Live in Freedom offers a challenge to such historically overdetermined hesitancy by focusing on what is left out of the progressive discourse about moving image representation of the struggle. I do this in the spirit of the late Palestinian writer and intellectual Fauzi al Asmar who features in today's film and who has stated publicly that culture is not only one of the most vital aspects of the Palestinian liberation struggle, it is the aspect which Israel hasn't ceased to steal and co-opt in order to construct an ersatz Israeli culture and Jewish peoplehood. My aim here is to draw attention to a largely ignored, often forgotten wave, an earlier wave of Palestine solidarity documentaries produced prior to the widespread use of video and certainly long before the digital turn toward the end of the period of new left filmmaking in the Anglophone world when cultural resistance to Cold War politics was relatively prolific. These earlier works are self-consciously pol positioned on the political left where they offer recognizable, if differing, critiques of Zionism, defined generally as an ideology endorsing ethnic cleansing, settler colonial occupation, and massacres, and rationalizing them as justified in the name of Jewish safety, along with analyses of the struggle through utilization of cinematic techniques which bear clear intellectual affinity to Marxism. The point of my talk is not to suggest that contemporary Palestine solidarity filmmaking filmmaking should rehearse or revive the aesthetic practices of such earlier works, a futile and potentially dangerous act of abstract nostalgia, 
but to register and deploy the very fact of the anachronism they represent today in order to reinvigorate historical investigation of the root causes of the Palestinian-Israeli struggle and as such to foreground and critically objectify to reorganize and orient towards action the ideological blockages preventing contemporary Palestine solidarity films from more effectively realizing their ostensible aim of enabling oppressed Palestinians to speak, to tell their stories, to supply their analyses of the dire situation they continue to face, in effect, to put Palestinians first. The crucial aim of the solidarity films of this period, which lasted from the late 1960s through the early 1980s, was to overcome the multifaceted self-censorship and censorship for which genuinely open discussion of Zionism is taboo and under Israeli law, veritably illegal, and which promotes a range of discursive approaches from the appearance of reasonability and moderation to an ideology of complete detachment from Palestinian suffering. Uh, Hisham Ahmed captures this sentiment perfectly when regarding Arab American discourse and the question of Palestine, he asks, how could Palestinian rights be retrieved if the solution proposed does not address all of the components of the Palestinian problem? This is not to say that radical solidarity cinema was or is widespread. Yet, its significance should not be underestimated, if only because it emerged, if briefly, within the context of a Palestine liberation movement, including within Israel itself, linked ideologically at the time to various strands of Marxism, and as such engaged in highlighting the deep structural connections between Zionism, colonialism, racism, patriarchy, and capitalism as a world system. That movement would persist in Palestine until the compromises of the Oslo Accords led to the reformation of a Palestinian comprador class and to the decline of class analysis of the anti-colonial struggle, a phenomenon that, with few exceptions, has persisted until recently, when once again calls for it by Palestinians and progressive Israelis have been issued. This avoidance of class analysis is all the more striking in view of right-wing Zionist Zev Jabotinsky's own acknowledgement of the role of capitalism in the Zionist project. He said, national funds which support the proletarian Chalutzim or pioneer settlers are being provided by the bourgeoisie. That bourgeoisie is daily being urged to leave the diaspora and come and build factories in Palestine. It must be added here that as Fauzi al asmar reminds, the vast majority of radical Israeli elements, such as those associated with Mott's Pen, a neo-Trotskyist formation, and the Communist Party of Israel with its large Palestinian membership, were unable to break completely from Zionism, whereupon their solidarity with Palestine liberation was always finally tenuous. It was the rare Israeli who broke ranks. Jewish-Israeli author and filmmaker Simon Luvish, the director of To Live in Freedom, was one of them. Uri Davis, a crucial member of the film's production collective, is another. Luvish began work on To Live in Freedom in 1971, nearly four years into the second Israeli occupation of Palestine marked by the Six-Day War of 1967. Luvish was born in Scotland in 1947, from which at the age of two he immigrated with his parents to the new, newly founded state of Israel, where he lived until returning to the United Kingdom in 1968 to study filmmaking in London. There he began an artistic career that included and has been dominated since 1979 by fictional authorship but that continues to include filmmaking. Lubish's first novel, A Moment of Silence, Journeys Through a Counterfeit Mezuzah, is partly a story about the making of To Live in Freedom and served as the background to a larger autobiographical narrative about an Israeli expatriate who returns home only to realize the irreversibility of his alienation from his Israeli fam family, friends, and colleagues and the Zionist ethic they carry. In an interview I conducted with him in June 2012, Luvish humbly downplays what I contend are the aesthetic strengths of To Live in Freedom. He said, it was a hodgepodge of amb ambitions, a kind of pirate movie, movie, not very well shot, I'm afraid, by me. I did better with the previous documentaries. It was too crude and my camera work is too wobbly. I couldn't get a visual take on the subject. I did it all better in writing. 
Perhaps this respectively self-critical evaluation is colored by to live in freedom's negative public reception. Again, according to Luvish, we had a premier in London to which we invited people from all the Arab embassies and the Israelis, this then requiring the cooperation of Inspector Parker of the Scotland Yard, although our bouncers were recruited from the South African Pan-Africanist Congress, Heavy Mob, who did an excellent job of frisking. This film was circulated in student, he continues, this film was circulated in student and independent circles and had a limited theatrical release in London, but was subjected to a strong boycott initiated by Israeli embassy sources and their lobbies in Europe and the US, with the result that I was unable to find funding for several proposed projects in the US in subsequent years. Of course, it was never shown anywhere on TV and was strictly blacklisted, he says, in the good old USA. We did have some public screenings in Israel. Lubitsch here displays a satirical humor that finds structural articulation in to, live, in to Live in Freedom in the form of an anti-aesthetic that draws subtly from montage tradition and the early praxis of carnival, in which social hierarchies and customs are overturned, often through irony and anachronism as a potentially revolutionary gesture. Apropos of Lubitsch's self-criticisms, <laughs> The film on its surface, read strictly through the device as it were, is cinematically neither challenging nor spectacular, which is not to say that it is not aesthetically skillful or interesting. Read structurally, that is, the apparent technical weaknesses cited by Luvish function in light of his life's work, not only as assets, but as indicative of the power of leftist filmmaking about the Palestinian-Israeli struggle. To live in freedom's dialectical narrative and playful yet rehearsed mix of compilation and direct shooting supply a compelling counter perspective to the prevailing Zionist history situating Israel as a haven for Jews wishing to escape the perceived universal and pe perpetual anti-Jewish racism of their native European countries. The film emerge, engages in dialectical looping, historical flashbacks, and contrasting editorial juxtapositions, and in this context supplies a sustained critique of Zionism that is noteworthy for its capacity to respect voices, which according to the intertitles marking the film's prologue, are not generally heard and remain hidden from public view. It would not in fact be an exaggeration to say that to live in freedom, is one of the most radical films ever made by citizens of Israel, Palestinians among them, concerning the theory, history, and implications and effects of Zionism. Like its more militant cinematic contemporaries, the pro Fatah, we are the Palestinian people, and the pro PFLP declaration of world war, to live in freedom calls into fundamental question the legitimacy of the Jewish state, examining the class struggle that exists in Palestine, Israel, conveying a history of Zionism from a perspective strongly sympathetic to Palestinian aspirations for both political and economic liberation. To live in freedom is distinguished, however, for the centrality it places on the role of Zionist ideology in propagating an integral component of the modern class struggle, racism. British racism against Arabs, Ashkenazi racism against Palestinians, and Mizrahim, or Jewish Arabs and European and US racism against Arabs and Jews. Indeed, to live in freedom might be understood in part as a cinematic precursor to the albeit ill-fated UN General Assembly Resolution 3379 adopted the year of the film's release, which determined that Zionism is a form of racism and fosters racial discrimination. Preceding Abdin Jabara's 1976 classic occasional paper, Zionism and Racism, to live in freedom stands to challenge Israeli reaction to claims that Zionism is an antidote to, rather than a fomenter of, racism, on solid intellectual grounds. Supplying both empirical evidence of the appalling, uh, appallingly unequal treatment by Israel of Palestinians and Mizrahim, and contextualizing that evidence within a historical trajectory by which, to paraphrase Jabara, anti-Palestinian discrimination is shown to exist not merely between individual citizens or private parties, but as part of public and state policy, contained that is not just in the way the laws are applied, but in systemic terms of the law itself, thus proving that racism is built in to the very structure of the Israeli state and the economy it supports. 
To live in freedom organizes its anti-Zionist counter-narrative into a structure divisible into 12 segments, each comprised of scenes extracted from cinematic archives in Israel and England, or shot live in contemporary Palestine, Israel, and the United States. Along its narrative line, To Live in Freedom argues forcefully against the Zionist claim that the antidote to European anti-Semitism, the most egregious modern instance of which, according to the film, was the Nazi Holocaust, is the formation of a modern Jewish majoritarian nation state in historic Palestine. To Live in Freedom tells the story of a failing settler colonial state, conceptualized during the late 19th century dusk of European expansionism, and justified through selective reading of the sacred and interpretive texts of Judaism as divinely promised to Jews alone, whereupon, pro whereupon proponents of Zionism, a broad-based coalition of Europeans and West Asians, some Christian but most self-identified as Jewish in cultural and or religious terms, the latter of whom finding themselves oppressed for that reason within their countries of origin were able to dissimulate their true aims of expropriating lands belonging to a substantial non-European, largely non-Jewish people, the Palestinian Arabs, long settled in the southwestern Levant, in turn permanently displacing and dispossessing them, at times massacring them outright and destroying a large percentage of their homes and villages in order to facilitate a process now referred to as ethnic cleansing that would itself facilitate the establishment of that for which Zionist ideologue Theodore Herzl had called much earlier in his classic utopian treatise a petty bourgeois Jewish state. In due course, to live in freedom insists that there is nothing rational or legitimate about a nation state in which, uh, as conceived in Zionist theory and later enshrined in, in Israeli law, Citizenship rights are based upon ethno-religious affiliation, a pre-modern condition that as such evacuates entirely the category of nationality from its sovereign structure defined strictly on a racialist logic contradicting some interpretations of Judaism as Jewish and thus exclusive of Palestinian determination. Following the Nakba, the film reminds us Israel enforced Ottoman era absentee property laws uh, declaring any Palestinian absent from his property for more than three days present absent and in turn justifying expropriation of his land and possessions and denying him the right to return. So I'm going to show you a first clip from the film and keep in mind that these clips are all from a very, very old uh, video uh, print. So please bear with the faded images and uh, the uh, somewhat unclear uh, subtitles and try to focus on the images and how they're, how they're put together. <laughs> October 6, 1973, Egyptian and Syrian armies invaded the areas occupied by Israel in the previous war of 1967. This was the fourth war between Israel and the Arab states since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Some months earlier, Israelis were celebrating their 25th Independence Day. From 
most Israelis, the State of Israel was the realization of a dream. For most Palestinians, it was the beginning of a nightmare. segregate not only Palestinians, but also Jewish Europeans and non-European Jews. Its structuring of otherness, therefore, does not follow a binary pattern. According to Lorenzo Veracini, Israel is, quote, a corporate effort for the purpose of settlement and not an enterprise exclusively or primarily aimed at accruing capital investment, where capitalism is at the service of settlement and not vice versa a pattern mirrored by ongoing and parallel attempts to force Palestinians to enter the wage economy. To appropriately convey these multifold social relations to live in freedom sets up, and we've seen the initial setup, uh, what Luvish has called a loose organization that enables focus on fragments of interest, which encourage a formal breadth of meaning atypical of both corporate reportage and socialist realism. Although more subtle than that of its contemporaries, this structuring is like that of, of those decidedly more militant and ideologically unambiguous films, evocative of what uh, film theorist Luca Arseniuk refers to as classical montages of revolutionary destruction necessary for collective self-determination. Uh, 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 self Indeed, To Live in Freedom offers more and other than an ironic mockery of the social contradictions riving the Levant. It takes the spectator beyond the strictly factual and anecdotal, helping transform the cinematic image into a demonstration of the method of dialectical thinking. As it presents us with ample historical facts about Zionism and numerous interview testimonials by Palestinians and Israelis, that is, to live in freedom tells us as much about their social determinations and effects through often biting editorial contrasts so that we are given to understand their structural place and meaning in the history of the global political and economic system, which leftist filmmaking of this period, which wished to see transformed. Although by no means a mainstream or industry film, it was made on a shoestring budget totaling six to 7,000 British pounds sterling, funded largely by U.S. Middle East Studies professor Don Peretz, along with private contributions from within the United Kingdom, and earned an informal endorsement from renowned Palestinian intellectual Edward Said. To live in freedom, like Zionism itself, emerged under conditions of great social and political upheaval, which enabled the sorts of uncommon alliances and analyses common to solidarity films of the period. To live in freedom carried this cultural imperative far beyond the official norm and its taboo against questioning the Jewish character of the Israeli state, by insisting upon categorizing political Zionism as crucial to the settler colonial nationalism that would, through population transfer of Palestinians, subjugate the Levantine land under conditions of rising U.S.-led neo-colonialism following World War II. 
Self-consciously intent in, on placing Palestinian perspectives at its critical center, the film demystifies Zionism by the indubitable presence of Palestinians long before the first Zionist incursions, their forced expulsion by Zionist militias, and the support and acquiescence for Zionism by the international community enmeshed in a Cold War that would last nearly half a century and bring about the division of the globe into competing spheres of influence dominated by the United States on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other. Consistent with the Palestinian revolutionary nationalist call for, of the period for one democratic state in historic Palestine for all its citizens, to live in freedom is troped midway and then again more extensively at film's end by an insistent present tense interview with Fauzi al-Asmar by then living in exile in the U.S. after enduring the demise of his independent anti-Zionist political organization Al-Art and 17 months of unwarranted administrative detention and torture in an Israeli prison. Now I'm going to show you uh, this clip and uh, again keep in mind the subtitles are very unclear, they're hard to read. Uh, Fauzi is discussing elements of Palestinian second class citizenship, uh, socioeconomic, legal, economic. He's talking about the censorship of literature, um, the rejection of, uh, of Palestinians from the Hebrew Writers Union. He's talking about the class-based nature rather than the national or ethnic-based uh, understanding of the uh, Palestinian-Israeli struggle. And he's calling for uh, a, a one-state solution to the conflict in the context of, of critiquing the idea of the, uh, the legal Jewish right of return uh, in Israel. כערבי שחי בארץ, אני בישראל, אני מרגיש שאני חי כאזרח ממדרגה שנייה. אני חי בהפליה, אפליה שאפשר להגיד אפילו הפליה גזעית, למשל צנזורה. יש, יש צנזורה על הספרות הערבית. עכשיו אמרו שרוצים לה, לה, לחסל את זה, אבל אינני יודע אם זה נכון. אבל למשל... הספר הראשון שלי, שנקרא הארץ המיועדת, עבר צנזורה, חסלו, הוציאו ממנו שירים שלמים, שורות, אפילו מילה אחת. למשל, יש עוד הפליה גדולה לגבי אגודת הסופרים. אגודת הסופרים העבריים בארץ מתנגדת לקבל את הסופרים הערבים, אפילו אם מישהו כותב בעברית. יש גם הפליה בנוגע לחינוך. למשל, תנ"ך מלמדים אותנו שהארץ הזאת ארץ המיועדת ליהודים וכך הלאה וכך הלאה. בו בזמן שאנחנו בתור ערבים מרגישים שזו ארץ שלנו, זו אדמה שלנו, זו המולדת שלנו, ואף אחד לא יכול לגנוב את זה מאיתנו. אפילו לא יכול, לפחות יכול להשתיק את האנשים לא לדבר, אבל לא יכול להוציא מהם את הרגש שלהם לגבי הארץ. טוב, איך אני רואה את העתיד, מה היית אומר לישראלים? באמת, אני לא אוהב להגיד למישהו, אבל אני אגיד את דעתי. אני רואה את הבעיה יותר, בעיה מעמדית יותר ממה שבעיה לאומית. זאת אומרת, זה לא מספיק לי שפייסל הוא ערבי, שחוסיין הוא ערבי, שהוא יפתור לי את הבעיה שלי. הוא לא יפתור את הבעיה שלי, הוא לא יפתור את הבעיה להפך. אני חושב שהוא, יפתור, שהוא יזיק יותר ממה ש... לפתור. Uh, למשל, מה ההבדל בין דיין וחוסן? שניהם, שניהם uh, עומדים באותו, באותו, השכ... באותו המעמד ושניהם יש להם האינטרס שלהם. בואו למשל ניקח את המלחמה האחרונה, 73. האם המלחמה הזאת פתרה איזושהי בעיה? האם פתרה את הבעיה העקרונית, בעיית הפלסטינאים? אינני חושב. היו לנו עוד הרוגים משני הצדדים, עוד שבויים משני הצדדים. היא גם לא פתרה את הבעיה החברתית בארצות ערב. טוב, לדבר על משטרים ערבים. רוב המשטרים הערבים, אינני יודע אם הם עושים משהו למען העם. 
הם עושים הרבה למען הכיסאות שלהם. גם ההנהגה הישראלית, ההנהגה הישראלית, במשך שש שנים בעקבות המלח... מלחמת יוני שישים ושבע, לא, לא עשה שום צעד חיובי למען השלום. להפך, שמענו על, על גירושים של אנשים, על ביצוץ בתים, על מעצרים, ומי שילם אחרי שש שנים? העם בישראל שלם, העם הפשוט, המנהיגים עדיין יושבים בכיסאות. כיום מדברים הרבה על הסדרי שלום. כל אחד רוצה הסדר שלום. גולדה מאיר, דיין, שרון, רוצים שלום. סאדאת, פייסל, חוסיין, וכולם, כולם רוצים שלום, אבל איזה שלום? כל אחד בדרך שלו, כל אחד עם התנאים שלו. מדברים על הקמת מדינה פלסטינאית כפתרון, כשלום. טוב, אם הפלסטינאים יסכימו, או רוב הפלסטינאים יסכימו להקמת מדינה פלסטינאית, ואם המשטר הציוני יסכים לזה, אז זה יקום. אולי, אולי יהיה איזה צעד חיובי, אני לא יודע. אך לדעתי גם זה לא, לא יפתור את הבעיה העיקרית. הבעיה אינה בעיית גבולות. קילומטר פה, קילומטר שם, זה לא הבעיה. הבעיה היא שהארץ הזאת שייכת לשני עמים. העם היהודי הישראלי והעם הערבי הפלסטיני. שניהם שייכים לאותו מולדת, הם צריכים לחיות יחד. עכשיו, אני גם רואה, לפי דעתי, וכאן אני בכלל לא מייצג אף צד, אני מייצג את עצמי, וזו דעתי אישית, שהפתרון שה, יהיה שתקום מדינה אחת, סוציאליסטית, חילונית, שת, שתהיה שייכת ל, לכל התושבים שנמצאים שם, היהודים שנמצאים. כיום בישראל, הפלסטינאים, הפליטים, אני נגד מדינה לאומית, אם זה ערבית או אם זה יהודית. זאת אומרת, הבעיה היא כל הזמן שתהיה מדינה יהודית תהיה אפליה. כל הזמן שתהיה מדינה ציונית תהיה אפליה. אפליה לא רק נגד ערבים, כיום יש אפליה נגד, נגד יהודים מעדות המזרח, נגד יהודים מרוסיה. למשל, עלייה לדעתי, או חוק השבות, חוק, חוק השבות הוא חוק די גזעני, אני אומר את זה בתור ערבי, הוא חוק די גזעני. אם יש לך אדם יהודי, מותר לך ל- ללכת לישראל. אני, שיושב שם כבר, לפי מה שאני יודע, 18 או 19 דורות, לי אין זכות כמו יהודי שיושב באמריקה. לא יש זכות, לא, לי אין לי אותה זכות. בני העם שלי שיושבים באוהלים, אין להם זכות. כי הדם שלהם לא דם יהודי. זה גם הישראלי חייב לחשוב על זה. So I'm going, to, I'm going to show you one more clip um, because I want, to, I want to discuss how to live in freedom unmasks one of the greatest myths of Zionism, that the establishment of Israel entailed the predominant, if not exclusive, employment of Jewish labor, when in fact even on the kibbutzim, the collective farms on which perhaps 3% of the Israeli population lives and where the ideology of a Jewish return to the land was supposed to have been played out more ideally, most ideally, the employment of Palestinian labor was not only common from the outset, but has taken place under super-exploited conditions. 
In turn, the film unmasks an even more preponderant Zionist myth that the communalism in, uh, instanced by the kibbutz uh, movement was socialist in nature and thus did not exploit even Jewish Israelis themselves. The early dreams of a socialist Zionism attracted many European Jews. Immigrants in those early days were often drawn to the ideological core of socialist Zionism, the communal settlement, the kibbutz. Kibbutz Hanita was set up in 1939 on land bought mainly from absentee Arab landlords. However, the Palestinian peasants who actually lived on the land refused to give it up. Jewish paramilitary units went up to take the land by force, and the Jewish settlers followed. Nachno banu lechanita be 1939. <laughs> דרכים שלנו הובילו אך ורק רקעת התיישבות שיתופית ושיתוף מלא. In the kibbutz, all property except personal effects is held in common. Work is organized on a collective basis. The children are raised and educated together in age groups. Kibbutz Hanita has over the years reached a certain affluence. This is due partly to the members' efforts, partly to subsidization by the government, and partly due to the fact that the kibbutz owns a factory which employs over 80 workers who are mostly Oriental Jews from neighboring towns and villages. אנחנו uh, התחנכנו לקראת עבודה עצמית ובשום אופן לא רצינו לחשוב אי פעם שאנחנו נצטרך להיות כביכול מנצלים של uh, אנשים אחרים עד היום אנחנו מתנגדים לזה, עד היום אנחנו מחפשים פתרונות לזה ואני משוכנע שגם לזה נמצא את הפתרון טוב דיברת על רווחה, שהקיבוץ הגיע לרווחה, ואין שום פסול שיהיה לו רווחה כמה שיהיה, כמה שיותר, כמה שיעשה יותר כסף, שיהיה לו יותר רווחה. יש שום בעיה, הוא יכול לחיות על הרמה הכי גבוהה שהוא מגיע אליה. שאלה של התברגנות זה משהו אחר, זה עניין של קפיטליזם, עבודה סבירה של הקיבוץ, זה מנוגד לערכים של הקיבוץ. דנים עכשיו איך לחסל את העבודה סבירה. אבל הקיבוצים לא הלכו להפסיד uh, מקור רווח כזה של ה, מה שהם uh, משקיעים uh, סוף השנה כבר ולא הלכו לחסל את הדברים האלה. So I'll conclude by, uh, by saying that according to El Asmar, who himself concludes the film with a lament over the fact that ordinary people must typically pay the price while leaders hold on to their power, to live in freedom notwithstanding atten its attention to class politics was resisted on the left, not for its ostensible cinematic unsophistication, but for the decision of its director and crew not to include more well-known, if critically less incisive, Palestinian activists and intellectuals among its interviewees. Consistent with its prologue, this small but significant film remained true to collectivist, anti-authoritarian principles, crediting everyone on the production team equally and ensuring the predominance of Palestinian voices and perspectives and thus the explicit critique of Zionism. 
Hence, the Communist Party of Israel, which boasted a large Palestinian membership, while nonetheless in deference to Zionism supporting the proposed U.S. partition of Palestine into one Arab state and one larger, more fertile, and well-placed Jewish state, expressed disappointment that the Modest El Asmar, as well as the relatively unknown Ahmed Masrawa, were the film's featured intellectuals, rather than Palestinian intellectual and activist Emil Habibi, an illustrious Communist Party member and author of the famous uh, Secret Life of Saeed, the ill-fated pessoptimist, which admits through its own dialectic the contradictions of collaborationism. The largely Jewish members of Mats Pen, an unremarkable film about which Mats Pen was made by Israeli director Aaron Torbiner in 2004, were similarly chagrined by their non-inclusion and reluctantly gave the film a stilted, lukewarm review. Such petty sectarianism should not overshadow, indeed it underscores, the political incisiveness of To Live in Freedom and the ideological shock value produced by its critical revelations about Zionism's core of racial exploitation, even among the filmmaking collective's surely most committed allies. Thank you very much. Uh, essentially, two questions. Uh, the man in the uh, patterned shirt who is uh, speaking for, uh, who is he? Okay, that is Fauzi El Asmar. Okay, uh, I noticed that he was speaking in Hebrew. Yes. Uh, and uh, what are the implications of that? Uh, and secondly, uh, some weeks ago, the film, uh, uh, The Seeds of uh, conflict was uh, uh, premiered here, and uh, the, it's going to be on PBS tonight, 9 p.m., uh, and I recommend it to everybody. Uh, what is your take on uh, that film, and what does its production and sponsorship by the U.S. government uh, and its appearance on uh, PBS uh, indicate to you? Okay. Um, first of all, um, Fauzi uh, spoke in Hebrew in this film, uh, and it was a deliberate choice on his part and the part of the editorial collective, and it is, it, it is a choice that was criticized um, from within the Palestinian uh, camp. Um, the reason that the choice was made to, to have Fauzi speak in, in Hebrew uh, was to, at that time, to show that he could, in fact, speak proper Hebrew. Which, which he did. Um, in terms of uh, the, the, the con seeds of conflict, I haven't had the opportunity to see the film yet, so I, I can't really comment further on it, but it's a very interesting. It's been supported by the U.S. government, and it's being shown on a major television network. I don't, I don't think that it will produce the kind of uh, <laughs> effect <laughs> um, that this presentation has pr uh, on, on this, uh, on this uh, woman, for example. I would just predict that, but I don't know. I haven't seen it. How familiar do you think he was with the Palestinian, uh, the Palestine film unit of um, Mustafa Abu Ali and Sulafa Jadallah, who were producing fi documentaries in the late 60s in the Palestinian diaspora? Right. Um, because it's, it, his style is very similar, mm -hmm. um, although some of those films were silent. Um, uh, so I'm just wondering if you know anything about that. And well, yeah, he said that he'd been able to see some of those films and, and, yeah, that he had been able at the time to see those films uh, and, and certainly was um, inserting himself. I mean, this, this film was made by a collective of filmmakers and, and uh, in cultural workers and intellectuals, and Luvish took the, um, took the position as director, and they, they had all had the opportunity to see several of the films uh, from the Palestine Film Unit and uh, wanted to insert themselves as part of of that general um, cinematic, militant cinematic movement. So did he, and he was, okay, so that was the idea that they were part of that. Right, right. Any ideas of how they saw him? I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Yes. Is there a written text of the 
we, I think we're going to, yeah. We're going to try to make that more available because this is, this is a really old video print as, me as mentioned. There is an old 16 millimeter print uh, at the New York City Public Library that's a little bit clearer, but the images are very, very faded. Uh, so I think here we're going to try to maybe do something with the subtitles to make them more clear. I really like the film, and I know it's old, but it reminded me of some of the new techniques, this, I don't know, the term cinema verite or the indie films. You know, they purposely blur things and things are jumpy. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of looked modern to me in mm -hmm. some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really interesting point because I think at this moment, uh, right now, film uh, filmmakers are looking back at this period, the militant period of, of Palestine solidarity and Palestinian filmmaking. Um, and, uh, and they are, I, I would argue for the most part that they're taking um, from that period formal techniques that are very interesting, um, but, but my argument is that they're not necessarily taking uh, intellectually or politically um, from that period. And I, I think that they, they might and should um, but I think that's why you get a sense that the film looks very contemporary in, in certain respects. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your lecture for the film too, even though it wasn't very clear, but we understand the point. I just want to make a comment, or maybe two, if, if I can, uh, regarding um, politics and uh, cinema. We cannot separate the two because politics, it was part of our life as a Palestinian and myself. And I grew up in, um, in Israel. I was born in Israel. And I know uh, Fauzi very well. He was a good friend of mine and of my uh, late dad. Now? Huh? Oh. Yeah, and regarding the Hebrew language, I grew up in Israel. We were forced to learn Hebrew. We have to learn Hebrew. And in high school, we have to learn not only the language and the literature and the grammar, we had to learn the Tanakh, which is the holy book of that. And we had to give a government exam at the end of high school with that. And what they choose, what they picked from the Old Testament, which this is the Tanakh, it's the oldest stuff that related to Israel, that Israel is the chosen, you know, the Israelis are the, ch the Jews are the chosen people, and this is the land that God promised them. And that's the conclusion, that's the point of the teaching. We weren't allowed as a Christian to learn Christian religion in school or for Muslim, Muslim religion because they were, they said separation, it's a public school. But yet we had to learn the, that part of the, mm. of the history, mm. which I call it history. It wasn't, the point wasn't to convert us, the point was to teach us history, to think in our mind that this is not our land, even though we lived there for years and years and uh, thousands of years. Still, it's not our land. It's for the people who came from Europe, basically. And one more comment regarding the new immigrants who came from in 1948 and before that, who came to Israel. It, th these people are the Zionist, and I'm, I'm saying Zionist organi organization because the people who came in the beginning, they weren't religious. And the people who, the Jews who came to Israel and they lived in kibbutzim, kibbutz, they weren't religious at all. Mm -hmm. they, they have nothing to do with the religion. And they were all European. So m none of them were from the Arab country, which is the, the Arab Jews. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, they in fact, they looked down at the Arab yeah. Jews. They didn't like them because they considered them backward. Yeah. And uh, the last comment, I have a friend, a friend of a friend who came from Romania and she lived in a kibbutz and years, like, 15 years ago or so, she said when they recruited her in the 50s to come to Israel, what they told them, she said that there is nobody in this land. This is what they were told. And it took her 15 years inside living in a kibbutz, 15 years uh, it took her just to see one Arab guy, one Palestinian pe you know, person living there because they were isolated, they were lived in kibbutz and they, were, they weren't allowed to mingle or to assimilate with the mm. population. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Um, I just want to just want to say that the the song in Hebrew that you heard over the soundtrack um, uh, is this, it's a an, an anthem. You probably have heard it yourself when you were there. Um, that's that trans the title of which translates in English as in the in the ho land of our fathers, and it's directly drawn from the the Tanakh, and it, it offers this this um, biblical <laughs> justification for the Jewish colonization of Palestine. Yeah. I would like to comment uh, in what you said. I'm a Holocaust survivor, and uh, children were taken from Bergen Belsen. Some of them so young that they didn't even know when they were born or where they were born, their parents killed. And groups of Zionists, mostly Zionists, took them from all over Europe where they had been dispersed and from Bergen-Belsen and brought them to Israel, not to subjugate anybody, but to make them live in a place that was safe for them. I am also not a Zionist. I strongly disapprove of ev just about everything Israel is doing right now. But I disagree to some extent with what you say because when I went to Israel to visit with some of the people who are now my age and some of them live, uh, they're all secular, uh, all of them are for coexistence, for sharing. None of them are people who believe in suppression of anybody else. So, and they are all refugees and they consider everyone who has been uh, pushed away and pushed out of their places as refugees themselves. So th this was my experience talking to the 50 odd children from Bergen-Belsen who are now Israeli citizens and the things that they lived with, the things that they disagree, they are uh, one and all members of peace movements and uh, so it is, uh, so how, how do it's a complicated, it's, it's an extremely complicated position, but I, uh, you how do you disagree? That's my own personal experience. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, I, th I think that, you know, there's so many simplifications of, of issues uh, and not enough nuanced uh, understanding of things. I, I th uh, I'm very conflicted. I, I want Israel to, I want Israelis to live in peace. I want Palestinians to live in peace. I, uh, I write letters constantly <laughs> to the po po politicians in, in Israel about settlements, about walls, all of the things I disagree with, about torture. I get back formulaic letters or uh, that have, you know, that address not a single thing that I raise. And uh, I'm a pacifist, I'm an a political activist. Well. I, I, but <laughs> I think that we need to uh, have a, a more nuanced, not such a one-sided always view of things. We, I think that one of the things we tend not to do is to look at both sides of things or three sides oh, of things. I'm looking at my side. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, uh, but your side should also include other sides and my side should also include other sides. This, this is just my, my personal thing is that I, I'm for inclusivity. I am against with all of my being against exclusivity because exclusivity is what conduces the conditions that we live in today all over the place. In America, racism, uh, all over the place, killing, wars. So uh, that's all. I mean, sorry, I think in this respect, Fauzi al Asmar would agree with you yes, because course, he's yes, calling for course. a one state. Of course, and, yeah. and one of the things that he said that I 
totally agree. It's, it's, it's never the powers that be that pay. The, uh, it's always the, the, the ordinary people, the, and mostly it's the children, and nobody gives a damn about the children uh, who suffer because they're just not counted, they're not profitable, and they don't matter. Sorry. I just, I, um, well, I have several things I want to say. The simple thing is, how long is this film? Is it available? Okay, this film is uh, approximately one hour in length. Um, there is this old video uh, print available in uh, a library in Canada at the University of Tr Toronto, and I don't believe that that uh, tape is circulated. And there is a 16 millimeter print at the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts Library branch of the New York Public Library. So it's not very readily and easily no. available no. in any way. No. Um, I see. Well, I, I wanted to, you know, just comment on, it's almost like a snapshot in time. It's 40 years old, this film, right? Mm -hmm. And um, And it's, but, we're still grappling with some of the same questions. It was interesting to see that uh, Fauzi al Asmai ta talked about it through cl class struggle and that kind of, and we're sp uh, but he's still calling for one state, right? And so we're talking about that now, but kind of from a different lens. And um, so, but and I really thank you for your talk because I think it t contextualized that whole uh, way of thinking and that time period and this type of filmmaking. So um, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay.